I'd like to introduce our first panel from Idea to Investment. Um, and in particular, I'd like to introduce you to our uh, moderator, Do Dr. Colleen Cunningham, who is an assistant professor of strategy and entrepreneurship at LBS. Hi, everybody. That was an exciting talk. I'm still buzzing and thinking about the different opportunities in digital health that uh, was brought up. Um, I want to start the panel with a bit of a slightly provocative statement, although in the context of the last talk, maybe it's not so provocative. Um, innovations in digital health are poised to radically change the way that we diagnose illnesses, the way that we treat and cure them, and also the way that we, you know, that healthcare systems manage themselves over time. And we're thinking both the public healthcare system like NHS and then other private healthcare systems globally. To that end, um, over the past five years, the number of digital healthcare startups that have been funded by venture capitalists has more than quadrupled. Also, we're finding more and more health systems are looking at ways to partner with startups, to engage with startups, to implement digital healthcare change in their systems. Um, however, yet, uh, there's amongst all this promise, there are many challenges in moving from a, a really innovative digital idea to getting investment in that idea. Um, so that's the subject of our panel today. Um, and we have two experts in this area, uh, um, Vishal and Jared. I'm just going to get them to introduce themselves and their roles in this space, and then we'll start with questions. So, Vishal. Brilliant. Thank you, Colleen. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me, guys. So, so brief background, I was a doctor for a couple of years in the NHS and then moved into consulting for a few years and now working at Ada Health. So Ada Health is an AI-powered symptom checker. Uh, it's a phone app, so you guys can all sort of download it, check it out um, on the App Store or Google Play. So you put in your symptom, ask you a series of questions. At the end, it will give you a list of possible causes and next steps advice. Um, um, I shall leave it there, and we can sort of get into more of the details of what we do and the whole AI and implications for healthcare during the panel, I'm sure. Thanks. All right. Hi. Jared Mabry, I'm the Chief Information Officer for HCA Healthcare UK. So HCA Healthcare UK is a subsidiary of HCA, Hospital Corporation of America, largest private health organization in the United States, uh, 185 hospitals. And uh, within the U, uh, UK, we have six primary acute care facilities, uh, private care, and then a number of great uh, other lo locations and uh, clinics across, uh, across the U UK. Great. So thanks very much. I just want to join, join me in welcoming my panelists. In your guys' experience have been the most impactful trends uh, in the digital healthcare uh, startup space over the last few years. Uh, you can't look anywhere without seeing something about AI, something about machine learning, something about how all of this is going to uh, change our lives. And right now we're kind of on the precipice of that, and we've got this great opportunity to see that actualized. And, you know, within the healthcare space especially, you know, for, for the last three to five years, everybody said, you have to collect this data. You have just mountains of data. You've got to do something with it. So healthcare organizations spent millions of dollars, millions of pounds, putting together uh, ways to collect this information and this data. But then they said, oh, what do we do with it? <laughs> and so now the opportunity is, what do we do with all of this data that we have? Because it's all so uh, fundamental to improving healthcare. And I think that that is probably the biggest opportunity we have is how do you leverage these assets that we already have? How do we better improve that? And then how do we use that to connect with our patients, improve the, their lives, improve the uh, way we, uh, they access care? So I think those are some of the big opportunities for us in the space. Right. From a healthcare system perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We shall? So I guess since we're talking specifically digital healthcare, I think when we talk about healthcare innovation, there's a lot of different categories. There's a lot of medical device innovation going on, a lot of medication innovation going on. But if we're thinking digital, then for me, it's all about patient empowerment and increasing access to healthcare. So that, that I kind of talking about that globally. So I'm talking about that within the UK where there are not enough doctors to go around. I'm talking about that in the developing world where access to a doctor is difficult even if there are enough doctors in, a, in, in the city if you're in a rural area. So the idea of digital is that it brings that healthcare expertise to you 
And so I think that's one of the biggest opportunities we have. Um, so I think that one of the, actually, the, one of the things that most impresses me in healthcare from an innovation point of view is when some of these very innovative, exciting startups are able to talk with the long-standing institutions, so the likes of HCA, the likes of NHS. So when the two can partner and the integration can happen, I think that's the real innovation because, I mean, that's what we're living through at Ada at the moment. You know, we're speaking with countless organizations tackling that whole integration issue because without that connectivity between what the startup wants to do and that innovation and the, um, the, the, the institution who has the access to all the patients, I don't think that we will get anywhere. I don't think that being a purely consumer-facing digital healthcare ap application, you can really crack it unless you're partnering with those organizations that have access to the patients already. So I think that that's the bit which is really exciting but also a big challenge. But ultimately, why do we care about digital health? It's about increasing access to healthcare and actually increasing the consistency of the quality of healthcare that every single person across the world gets. I think that's the really exciting bit. So I'll take up that baton on the challenges side and ask you then, so we have an opportunity with a lot of data and we have startups that would like access to that data to make their, to engage patients with their um, with technology. So what are the challenges right now in, in meeting that interface and having these two things come together? Why, why haven't we seen yet the sort of alignment between these two? Maybe I'll start yeah. with you again, Jared. Yeah, I think that this is where, um, you know, it's equally impressive is to see startups go toe-to-toe -to -toe and into these organizations uh, and start to understand what the challenges are and then be able to figure out ways to address them. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's far and few between, uh, you know, that's, it just doesn't happen as often as, as you'd like. You, somebody comes up with a great idea and then it's, well, I'm just gonna run off and become the next Uber. But instead, it's looking at how do you come into an organization, understand the challenges, and really use digital uh, technology to improve that process, improve the care uh, that we're providing, or just look at where the opportunities are and drive that. And I think that the way to do it is, is to come in, you don't know what you don't know. And I think the more that you can uh, come into it with the attitude of, I'm here to learn, and we want to partner and not that this is the way it has to be because this is my idea. Mm -hmm. Just evolve the idea, evolve the opportunity, look for ways to, uh, to really uh, integrate. And I, I think that's where those biggest opportunities come in. Mm -hmm. And it's just sometimes it's, one, it's the access. It's trying to find ways to bring folks together. I mean, it's one of the reasons that, um, you know, we as HCA want to partner more and more with digital health startups because this is the future. This is the future of how we deliver healthcare. This is the future, to your point, of how we empower our patients, how we democratize access to information and health uh, uh, healthcare. And I uh, and, and I think HCA we see that and we want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. From your perspective. So, so, so I think that, first of all, there have been success stories, right? So, yep. so I think we, mm -hmm. all, we can all probably uh, speak of at least a few success stories, and we don't have to go into those now, but there certainly are. There maybe aren't as many success stories as there are in other sectors, but absolutely some healthcare startups have really managed to very well integrate into private and public healthcare systems and do a great job of it. So I think that, you know, fr from my experience at Ada and just sort of reading around the topic, there's a couple of areas that, that become a big challenge for digital startups. Um, so one, one, one area is the financial. So of of course, every single startup has the financial pressure, especially once you've got investors on board and there's revenue targets to be made. Now, the challenge there is that actually the relationship in the terms of engagement uh, between a startup and a healthcare institution isn't always about let's pay you lots of money up front startup. It's more about let's give you access to the data. Let's start with some money on the table because without any money on the table, there's no point. No one's got any incentive to continue working. But it's about building that long-term strategic partnership. And unfortunately, some investors don't always have that long-term view in mind. Um, and I think the second thing is actually from the startup's point of view, I don't think all digital health founders really understand the challenges involved with running a digital health startup and how it's actually very different from any other sector. So I think they go into it saying, ah, oh, well, loads of people are unwell and I've got a great product, so clearly they're just going to start using my product and, and clearly people care about health, so they're going to pay for my product. And the, the difficulty with that is that actually individuals are very uh, averse to paying for healthcare because in most countries in the world, someone else is paying for it, whether it's the government, for example, in the UK or insurers in the US. And I know there's under insurance insurance and et cetera in the US, but still there's an expectation the insurers will pay for it. Um, so, so that becomes a challenge 
Um, so, so, so for you as a founder, it then becomes more of a, of, of a long game and it's a lot of hard work. So the regulatory side is a lot of hard work as well. And I think that you have to have a real passion and commitment. And I think that you need to kind of really understand the system from the inside. So I guess it, it's probably, um, it's probably makes sense for me to say very briefly the trend I've seen in, in doctors starting up uh, digital health companies and how that can be really, really, um, a really, success, really a big success story actually because they understand the system, they've got credibility you have by being doctors and of course they have to partner with the right people, the right technical people, um, the, the, right, um, the right sort of business people but still I think that's a really interesting trend. And just, just one final point that, that the other side of that is as doctors become increasingly interested in innovation that means that on the other side of the fence when you're speaking to the large healthcare organizations they are very receptive to your idea because actually they are very interested and they can see the benefits of it and they become the champion to help you bring it in. So I think you know you guys are probably all aware of this whole champion idea. You need to find a champion in one of these healthcare organizations to help bring your idea to fruition. And if it's clinician, that's even better because clinicians are typically uh, very well respected in, in, in the healthcare organizations. So. Great, thanks a lot. Um, that's a great segue into the next question that I wanted to ask you, Vishal, which was, you know, Ada Health is one of the, has been one of the fastest growing startups in this space, at least over the last year. Um, can you tell us what do you think concretely were the key ingredients that have made your guys' company be so successful up until this point? So I'll talk about two things. I'll talk about the, the B to Z growth, and then I'll talk about the B to, B to B side of things. Mm -hmm. So if we start with the B to Z growth, you know, you're absolutely, absolutely right, Colleen. It's been a really fast growing um, journey over the last year for us. And I think that that comes down to a couple of things. So the one, one thing is that fundamentally we're solving a problem that every single person in the world has. So if you, if you become unwell, it's so much easier to try and find out what's wrong with you by going on your computer and Googling it than having to make an appointment with a doctor, travel to the doctor, or even pick up the phone and speak to a doctor. It's just so much easier to sort of, whilst you're watching TV, put the symptom in. So I think that we've really struck upon something that, that people are, are, are very interested in engaging with. The user experience that we've got really helps. Um, and I think sometimes these user experience is forgotten a little bit about in healthcare, especially amongst the more longstanding institutions. If you see some of the apps that some of the hospital groups will come up with, they really are quite awful. Uh, people don't think about user experience. They think if you're unwell, you're obviously just going to uh, use our app anyway because you're unwell. But actually, people have to want to do it. Um, so, so I think the user experience has been really strong for us. And we've also been very keen to go global. So we've advertised um, in every country in the world. And as a result, you know, I think we were number one app in sort of 130 countries plus around the world. But, but the point there is that we, we haven't said that, you know, we're just going to look at the UK. Uh, we've said that actually ADA is, 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 is valid globally. And of course, with that comes challenges. So there's language issues and we're, we're expanding our suite of languages right now. So on the B2C side, I think that so those are some of the things. And I guess the other thing I'll say is that we're very um, receptive to user feedback. Uh, so we will look at user feedback on a daily basis and make the improvements based on that. So I guess when, when you're a user of, of a product and you see that it is improving every day, so a lot of people will put their symptoms in one time, complain, and actually they'll try to put their symptoms in again a few mm -hmm. weeks later, and they'll come back to us and say, hey, well, this time Ada got it right. So, mm -hmm. so you know, we do really focus on that. I think on the B2B side, it's more of a challenge, um, and that's, um, that's, that's a very separate story. But there I don't think it's so much about growth, but more about going deep with a few organizations. So, so I think that's, that's where you should focus B2B be not massive scale growth, but deep, uh, in deep partnerships. So Jira, from the buyer's perspective, what, now that we've been teed up by the B2B, what um, <laughs> what's, have some successful startups done to basically make it an easy yes for you to get involved? And then you might say on the flip side, what's an easy no for you to not get involved? With yeah, you? absolutely. You know, I think one of the things that I've, I've sat down with a number of founders or um, uh, you know, CTOs from some of these companies, and you have a lot of really great, passionate ideas. I mean, just, and I'm, I love ideation. I will sit in a room hours with these folks and just draw things up on the whiteboard and think, this is the greatest thing ever. But then they come into it with the idea of, you know, we want to, we want to partner. We want to, we want to look at how we can bring this together. We need to learn about how this works, to your point, from the inside. Uh, we need to learn what that looks like, and that's what they're seeking, first and foremost. And then, you know, from that, 
that makes me want to invest. That makes me want to say yes. These are, this is somebody that I love the passion. I love the ideas. I love the learning mindset and that desire to just be a part of the company and be a part of the organization and help drive something for us uh, versus, you know, again, it's this, um, uh, the, the hard no is well, you start having the conversation. Uh, you know, that's, we, we, we've, we really, um, we really uh, don't see wanting to go that way. We don't want to see going this way. This is what it is. This is what we do. And, um, you know, we think w this is how this works. And it's okay. I mean, sometimes it does work that way. But sometimes it really, it doesn't. It, that once uh, healthcare can be messy. The inside of how all these things integrate and all these systems talk to one another and how the data flows and the patient workflows and how we navigate people through our hospitals and through the entire spectrum of I feel bad to I feel better is a, it, it's not, it, it's, uh, it's like on the back end of Amazon. If you looked at that, you would just be aghast because it, it's all ugly, but it works. Mm -hmm. And what we want is we want partners that want to say, okay, how, do we, how can we get into that and make it work better? How can we help you make it work better? Mm -hmm. But I, I think you've got to come into it with a learning mindset, a desire to be a partner, and a desire to uh, want something more than just a check, mm -hmm. and want to, want to have something, want to, want to maybe have that idea that we're willing to evolve, we're willing to pivot where necessary, and that my success is just as tied up as yours. Because at the end of the day, for these companies that want to come in and want to partner, we'll be their biggest advocate. Right. And a, 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 a $50 billion organization will be your, uh, be your driver. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a great place to be in. Mm -hmm. But it's having that mindset and it's having that approach whenever you come in and have the conversation. That's the, that's the biggest thing. And that's, uh, that's been the place where um, I, I just, you almost, within the first 10 minutes, you kind of know. Mm -hmm. And you kind of know, is this gonna, what, are the, what is the motivation? What do they want? And if they want a partner, if they want to learn and they want somebody that's going to help them accelerate their business, we're in. Mm -hmm. At what stage do firms, startup firms typically approach you? Um, yeah, I mean, I, so it's been really at all stages. So, you know, sometimes you'll have somebody do a random reach out and say, hey, we've got this great idea. You take a look at the tech and you say, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. And you bring them in. We've actually done reach, we've reached out to companies. We've reached out to several companies in areas like blockchain and places like that, that as an organization, we're looking to how do we get involved and invest in mm -hmm. and ex use startups to help us accelerate. You know, we've reached out to them. But, you know, a lot of the times it's going to be at that stage where, you know, they've got a round of investment, they've built a product, they feel like they're ready for that jumping off stage to really involve themselves in with a large organization and they want to make that sell uh, or that make that partnership. And that's where we'll have the conversation. But, you know, I don't think there's at any stage, once you've kind of got an idea and a, a prototype around what you want to be able to deliver, I don't think there's any stage that's a bad place it's just what you want out of that okay. because that evolves uh, because if you're coming into it with I've got an idea and want to partner and want to learn and want to grow then then that's that's where it is but if you come in and you say I've got something I want to sell it and I'm not as interested in the other stuff eh, you know that that just depends on what the idea is and where we where we are yeah. Are there some, you mentioned a few technologies, blockchain being one of them yeah. that you're sort of interested in right now. Are there other things that are t top of mind for you guys? Absolutely. I mean, so uh, I said it in the beginning, uh, all the AI and machine learning bits of being able to leverage the data, that's, uh, that's really important to us because we feel like that that's a way to differentiate. You know, I think that, uh, you know, Sarah said it, the NHS has this, found, this huge foundation of data. HCA does too. HCA has been an uh, organization that's been around for uh, you know well over 40 years, mm -hmm. and uh, we're getting on 50 years uh, next year. And so, we're we're at that place where we've got a ton of information. What do you what do you do with it? And so, um, you know, being able to use those as technology as technologies to accelerate that is huge. Uh, increase in mobility. I, you know, I, I would agree that a lot of times if we if you try and 
internally build apps with no concept of user-centric or human-centric design, you, yeah, it, it's really a mess. You just put it out there and say it'll come. Uh, but yeah, somebody will use it the first time and go, wow, I need to rethink my choices. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's like whenever you get a, you know, a new, uh, new iPhone or an Android device and it's got a new form factor and you're excited to use your favorite app on it and you pull it up and uh, it's, oh, it's not really built for this. And you can tell that nobody thought about the way I'm going to use this. You know, I, for us, it's looking at how do you, uh, you know, it's the same thing for us. And so, you know, we're also looking at places that uh, we can better engage our patients in their journey. You know, I think that that's, that's a huge space. And that's something that a lot of people have tried. And a lot of, there's a lot of great ideas out there. But it's just trying, trying to figure out what is, the, what is that right path. And it's going to be different uh, for every organization to a certain extent. But, you know, trying to find that, uh, that secret sauce for us. Sure. Um, I know that many of the people in the audience will have ideas and want to be entrepreneurs themselves. But other people um, I know in the MBA program are, are looking at it and maybe in a role like Jared in the future, or maybe within the system. Um, and so, Vichelle, for you, I'm wondering, what are some ways in which um, uh, existing firms healthcare systems can better engage with entrepreneurs, perhaps, to help that develop that partnership? So, I mean, I guess from our experience, we get a lot of both. So we get a lot of inbounds from some of the largest organizations globally. They kind of see uh, someone's tested their, our app within the organization or someone's seen a press release or something, and they'll, they'll email us. And, and, and so their driver will often be what you were just saying at the end, um, Jared, around sort of, uh, the patient the patient journey and improving the patient journey. So that will be one driver. So for them, there's always some type of driver or it's simply that they're very interested in, the new, on, in this new technology. They know that AI is going to be big and they can clearly see that Ada is one of the biggest players. So they want to come and, and speak with us. So, that, so that's what sort of tends to happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, once you then start those conversations, what makes, it, what makes it as smooth a process as possible from my point of view? I think it's when you can, uh, first of all, when there's quite an open initial conversation. So often we'll have conversations with organizations where they clearly have very fixed ideas about what you can and can't do, and they're not actually interested in how your product might evolve over time and how the partnership might evolve over time. They see it very much as a, I need, I mean, I'll give you the example because I was in India recently with a sort of group of uh, healthcare organizations and one of the one of the other organizations was a waste management company which kind of does what it says on the tin it's not necessarily massively innovative and so in that that's a classic case where you just want to come in and say this is what we want do you have it great tick the box whereas really we'd be more interested in, in individuals in organizations who said well what are you currently offering this is what our needs are and let's evolve that relationship over time because most digital most startups are looking to evolve they're not looking to be what they currently are so I guess that's one thing the other thing is to try and bring other individuals from that organization into the conversation as soon as possible. So often I'll have multiple conversations with one individual, but it's clear that we haven't brought the, dec the decision maker into the room yet. And the problem with that is the conversations go on endlessly and actually nothing will happen because the, the actual decision maker, the one who holds the budget, is not really interested. But that, that other individual finds it quite interesting to engage in the conversation. Um, so, so that can sometimes be a little bit frustrating. Um, and I guess that the last thing is to identify identifying within a large organization which is the department or area where your technology is going to be most relevant. So this is particularly the case when we go out and speak with pharma companies. I mean, pharma companies are massive. Every single country um, has got different priorities. Every single disease area within a country has got different priorities. And we'll find ourselves speaking to 10 different people uh, within even the same country team for a big pharma company. And we're not really necessarily having the same conversation with any of them. Um, but you really need to try and pinpoint where, where you can come in, where your edge is because there's no point in having endless conversations with multiple people in, the, in a large organization unless you can really understand uh, what your edge is in that particular niche of what the organization does. Great. Thanks very much. I think we'll go to some of the questions. The one that's been upvoted the most is on the top. It's for you, Jared. The majority of this, especially if you start looking at assets that were pre-EMR or even in the uh, early EMR days where the whole concept of structured, non-structured data was not a conversation that you really talked about uh, or that you really even anybody was looking at. You know, HCA has looked at, okay, how do we take this massive amount of data and uh, use natural language processing to start trying to identify that information. So we've heavily invested in NLP to help us do that. And then from there, be able to uh, use quality checks to be able to put that into enterprise data warehouse, 
appropriate uh, you know, processes to make sure good data in, good data out, and uh, great data governance uh, along the way and who has access and what, uh, what we can do. And so that's just, that's been a huge area for uh, a focus for us. And it's not easy. NLP is not a perfect technology, but you know, as we, especially as we've looked at the cloud as an accelerator, uh, being able to put some, get some of these data sets and use machine learning to accelerate uh, that NLP, it's, it's actually really, uh, really exciting space. And so um, uh, it, it, it's not perfect. It's getting better. And uh, it grows. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that uh, we'll continue to look at ways, uh, potentially with uh, you know, AI technology, to help us uh, continue to do that and better identify and uh, review this data. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, so let's go to the next top question from Slavia. Who should be li held liable if AI gets a diagnosis wrong? And then can we really replace doctors or is it a nice to have? So I don't think that any AI system, at least in the symptom checking space, is in the, is, is in the, uh, in the, the level of, of accuracy that we'd say 100% we're just happy, you know, just, just, just run with this and you really don't need to worry about seeing a doctor unless you need an operation or something. So I think we're very much in the space of, of collaboration right now. So. Um, the question around who should be held liable, so if you're an individual using the ADA app, the truth is that we put the onus on the individual to then go and seek care or further advice if they need it. So I would say that we put the liability on the individual, and I think that's probably how it will be for the next couple of years at least. Um, where we're partnering with an organization, then I would say that it's a little bit more complicated, and I think possibly the, 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 the organization would, um, would seek to put the safety nets in place. So by that, what I mean is at the end of an ADA assessment, you haven't closed the loop. You've only been told what might be wrong with you, but really you need to figure out what, treat, what are the best treatment options and where can you get those. And even if it's self-care, what exactly should you be doing? Should you be resting your leg and elevating it and uh, compressing it, all of those things. So, so all of that needs to be considered. So when we partner with an organization, I guess the idea would be that we would always be connecting to something within that organization. If it's self-care, we'll connect to some really high quality advice that that organization thinks is appropriate to show the patient. If it's seeing a doctor, we'll make sure that a doctor appointment can be booked via our app. So the idea, or via the third party app that we've integrated into. So the idea is you're always safety netting. Um, and, and apologies if that isn't the complete answer that you were looking for. I think this is very much a, a, a sort of a, a moving space and it's not an easy question to answer. Uh, can we really replace doctors? Um, so it's a very interesting question, but I have a very clear view on this. Like the answer is no. The answer is we'll have more doctors in the, in the future than we do now. They will be doing different things though. So you won't have doctors doing necessarily very mundane, repetitive tasks that if you're a GP, you do see maybe 10, 20% of your work is quite repetitive common cases which you could really do with your eyes closed the rest of it is more complicated same in pathology and radiology there's a s percentage of the work which is quite repetitive and AI should be should be doing that work so that you as a doctor can have more time on the more complex cases and on the cases which require a strong element of communication skills so breaking bad news about cancer it doesn't matter if the AI system is a better diagnosis a uh, diagnosis, for, uh, sorry, a better diagnoser of your cancer than a human doctor is, you will always have a human doctor involved in that process. You can never have a machine telling someone that they've got cancer. Um, and, and so I think the, the type of doctor we, we have in the future will be different. So they will be more communication skills focused. They will be more, they'll have much more of an innovation mindset. So, you know, I'm involved in a program at Bart's Medical School, which is called Bart's X. We, we've put um, innovation, healthcare innovation into the core curriculum for every third year medical student. Uh, over a three-day period in January, um, and that's tied to a pitching competition. So basically, we're trying to get them thinking in an innovative way. And I think in the U.S., there's even more going on in that space. So it's an innovative mindset. And the third thing is 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 engaging with technology. So doctors need to start engaging more with technology. I mean, at Ada, we've got about 50 doctors on our team, and and probably by this time next year, we'll have 100, we'll have 100 doctors on our team. What do they do? They help to build our medical content. They help to improve our medical content. They help to uh, decide the triage uh, out comes the, the triage advice and when we start partnering with organizations they help with the mapping of, of what condition is relevant for which service within that organization that is where a doctor comes in so, um, so so a doctor will always be involved but the role of doctors will definitely change
Jared, I'm sure you have thoughts on this question as well. I do. Yeah. You know, it was funny. As I saw this come up, I was really excited to answer it. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a great question because, you know, it's in, I, I think just take a step back. We're in a time where we're asking, can AI replace doctors? I mean, that's, that's sci-fi 10 years ago. I mean, so it's really, it's, and so the answer is absolutely not, but uh, it's really neat that we're having the conversation. Uh, you know, you know, who should be held liable? You know, if any facility, any healthcare organization is using only AI to diagnose and not having an actual doctor validate diagnosis, uh, they deserve to be held liable for that. Uh, but in all reality, it's um, looking at AI as an accelerator to a clinician workflow. I mean, we want to make our physicians and our nurses we want to we want to make them more productive. We want to make have it so that they can spend more time with their patients delivering care. Let's 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 le allow the technology to do that because ultimately it can provide lots of great insight and information. But we still need a doctor with all that training and that insight to be able to uh, make a good decision. And that's that's really the key. So you know the doctorless hospital or that that concept. While it may be in our lifetime that we see that, it's, we're, no, we're not near that yet. And even in any time, I don't really see us being able to do it completely uh, without, uh, without a doctor. Uh, you need somebody that can. Uh, you need somebody that can do that with that level of human intuition that our AI just can't replicate yet uh, to uh, to be able to uh, to make those really key uh, clinical decisions. So it's just. It's a neat, it's a really cool area though. Mm -hmm. Great, so maybe we'll go to the next most popular question. Yep. Just a little description about what, how you guys think you've been so successful in this space. Sure, so, so it's a good question. So I would say there are your first generation symptom checkers like WebMD um, who are using uh, hard-coded decision trees and algorithms where you basically, for example, you, you get told you have a headache and at that point there's a certain segment of the database that becomes relevant uh, because you said you have a headache. The way that ADA is different and AI systems are different is, uh, you, you, so we've got 1,100 conditions and 5,000 symptoms in our database, but that's increasing all the time. So last year we added, sorry, not last year, last month we added another 50 conditions, for example. Um, so so one thing in which we're different is if you think about a, a neural network of like 5,000 different lights and depending on what symptom you initially put in, about 1,000 of those lights will light up. Um, and then you answer the next question. And then every time you answer a question, Ada is trying to identify what is the most likely condition you will have. And based on that, what is the most important next question that we need to ask? And it will pull from any one of those 5,000 lights on the database in order to get a very personalized assessment for you. Um, so in that way, we're basically pulling the whole database in and we're using a probabilistic approach. So we will have an associ percentage association for individual symptoms with individual um, conditions within our database. And the last thing I would say is it's about learning. So at the moment, we're doing a hell of a lot of um, human supervised learning with our doctors. We're moving towards machine learning. We've done a lot of experimenting with machine learning and that's something that's, that's a process. And I think you have to be careful with machine learning. You don't want to create a black box where you can't go back and understand why a system made the diagnosis it did. So we're proceeding cautiously with that. Uh, but I guess that those are probably the main things, I would say. I think there's a really interesting next question here in general about, will that mean healthcare will get cheaper over time or more expensive? What do you think, Jared? I think that you'll for, you'll, for the foreseeable future, healthcare will stay at a roughly similar cost. Mm -hmm. uh, the, if it... Do I think it will contain uh, cost and potentially decrease it? Absolutely. If we don't, we will do it wrong if we don't get to a place where it actually decreases it. But there's only so far it can. Um, you know, because as the technology increases, the again, that R&D increases, the partnership, the cost of being able to do that, we're just, we're shifting. We're shifting in cost uh, around to uh, to be able to do uh, to be able to do and provide uh, health care and treatment. I think the idea is it will decrease in some places and then at best stay the same in others. Uh, you know, I, I, I it has an opportunity to create efficiency, and I think that that's what we want to be able to leverage. But it also has an opportunity to. Um, diagnose in ways we can't diagnose today, screen in ways we can't even imagine today, and those are things that uh, it's, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not free, and uh, it is an expensive venture to do it. Um, so I, 
personally hope and we are able to drive the cost down. And, uh, but, and I think that you'll see that especially in routine cases. Uh, routine information, routine things will become less expensive as they should uh, using the technology to do it. Michelle, did you have thoughts on that? I mean, I guess it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, my, my view is ultimately that, that for the majority of people, healthcare costs will hopefully go down um, with this technology, and that's the ultimate aspiration for most digital health companies. I mean, of course, for example, at ADA, we're hoping to increase the quality uh, uh, of access to, uh, to, of healthcare to individuals around the world and give people access who currently don't have it and reduce the cost. But I do think that there's some digital health innovations that might increase the cost for some individuals. So I'm thinking a little bit about the hospitality sector, I suppose, and I don't see a reason why you shouldn't say that some people who want the really high-end healthcare and are willing to pay for it, that they wouldn't get suddenly, because of all the innovation that's happening, an even better customer experience than they, current, than they currently are. And, 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 you know, fine, it might not be the most obvious thing when you're a digital health company to look at, but I do think that we can also think about healthcare as a hospitality sector, um, and it's not just about bringing the cost down for everyone. Um, it's also about increasing the quality of the experience for uh, for some people. So what I'm hearing is there may be areas in routine care yeah. that are that are uh, substantially improved in terms of efficiencies by digital health. What it might open up to us is new ways of diagnosing, yeah. things that we haven't seen in before, new treatments that may be costly at least initially, and then as well it opens up, say, segmentation of customers across differentiation of quality that may mean healthcare becomes more bifurcated um, in terms of choices. Great, so um, uh, this question has been up there for a, a while um, about ensuring privacy and data protection. Ensuring our patient data and information is our most valuable. For us, patient data is, uh, is that asset we have to keep uh, most secure, and so how do you do that? And um, it, it's, it's a lot of different ways, and so I am a big believer that technology is only a, a, a small part of the answer to that. It is. I mean, we can put all these great controls in place, but if somebody hits the wrong button, uh, things can happen. And that is the problem. It's, it is a education and awareness that is the only thing that's really going to keep us uh, safe and keep our information and our data safe. At HCA, we spend a lot of time and a lot of money building an information security and data protection aware culture. because. Our people are the uh, are, are kind of our greatest protection against information th threats to uh, information security. Uh, you know, bad actors that are out there that are evolving their techniques and tactics every single day. I mean, they and so that is that's the key at making it so that somebody sees something that doesn't feel quite right, and being able to say, that, eh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push the, I'm not going to click on a link. I'm not going to open something I shouldn't. I'm not going to share something that I shouldn't do. That they're aware of social engineering uh, tactics that can be so uh, prevalent in, uh, in certain organizations. This, these types of things, uh, they're, they're key. And so, um, we, again, we spend a lot of time on that, but we also spend a lot of time protecting our perimeter, putting certain techno uh, technology defenses in place. That's really, really important. But again, at the end of the day, it's all about people and culture and building a culture of awareness. That's, that's the biggest piece uh, for us, and that's where we spend a lot of time and focus. Maybe I'll ask you this next uh, question. What do you foresee in the future? We should be consider being a little bit more open with our data as patients because that's the way we're really going to improve healthcare by allowing people access to data so that the good things can happen from it because it's only very rare that bad things happen and mostly really good things happen when you allow people to use your data. I think about the Open Banking Initiative which is actually really interesting because it's hopefully going to push some very interesting and highly tailored products to individuals to help them make um, more efficient use of their of their money so why not make, make better use of uh, why not try to improve your healthcare in the same way. Um, so this question around bottlenecks next um, for digital healthcare companies. So, so I think that the, the real challenge with digital health is that healthcare sales cycles are quite slow. So if you're sort of looking to go into, 
into sort of large organizations, that can be a challenge. It can take some time. Regulatory is, is, is another bottleneck. I mean, it's not a bottleneck. I think it's ever evolving. And the difficulty in digital health is actually the companies are very well very much ahead of the regulatory of regulatory bodies, and therefore it becomes really difficult to, to, to figure out. You basically have a lot of gray areas in digital health that people don't really know how things should be rated or graded or accredited. We often get asked, oh, are you guys accredited? But there isn't this one accreditation for an AI system that works globally, um, the, like, like there might be in other sectors. So I think that that sometimes can be a challenge. Um, so, so, so and, and, and I think that the, um, that the other challenge is the is identifying the value. So in healthcare, it's a lot more about helping organizations to save money than it is about increasing the number of people that you can come that you can get through the, the door. So in other industries, you kind of sell someone a new food product or whatever, and you can basically make money because it's a new product and people want to buy it in addition. In healthcare, you're very much trying to do a cost-benefit analysis all the time. And that can be quite a challenge. First of all, it's a very hard thing to measure. And secondly, it's, um, it's a long-term thing. So you may not be able to prove it out in the first year or two, but you're trying to get a contract where you want to get some money in the first year or two. So I think that that can be a challenge sometimes times as well, depending on what technology you have. Some lend themselves much better to cost-benefit analyses than others, of course. Jared, I don't know if you can speak to this question about trying to implement, say, uh, digital healthcare uh, uh, initiatives within the organization about administration uh, within HD and what the bottlenecks might be within a big organization. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just uh, big ships turn slowly. <laughs> And, 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 all, and as much as uh, I hate to think that way, it's, it's really true. It's looking at how do you, how do you take a well-defined patient journey or pathway and create that, turn that into a digital pathway. And um, there, there again, there are so many moving parts to it that aligning all those parts and pieces, that, that is the challenge. And again, that's why I was talking in the beginning that we want partners because we need people to help us figure out how to do some of those things because we are, um, especially you know, HCA is an operator culture. We operate hospitals. We know how to efficiently deliver care to our patients and provide great outcomes in the process. That, that is what we're there to do. But none of that says that we are a digital uh, healthcare company and that we're ready to make that tr transition. We want to. We uh, see the value in doing that. And we can deliver our, our, our mission better by doing it. It's just uh, a taking a legacy of uh, almost 50 years worth of process and turning that into something that's very new it's uh it's it is it is challenging and uh, but i think with the right willingness to do it and getting all, all the right people engaged and then finding the right partners to help us with it it's amazing to see the outcomes that we can get and how how we just want to uh, be able to invest and move more quickly what would be your one top piece of advice for someone who's trying to get into the digital healthcare space that has an, an idea and in, innovation and they want to take it forward and maybe look for investment? You know, from my perspective, it would be uh, take a uh, take a leap, ask and want to want partner early. I think that that would be the really key. And it, whether it's partnering with a big organization like HCA or finding the right clinical partners to work with, the, you know, our, our uh, doctors or nurses or the, the, the party that you're building this for or patients, uh, whomever you're building your product for, partner with them early and look for those opportunities to, to learn and absorb, understand the language, understand how the, how the process that you're trying to change works today. And, and how you can then influence it to build it better. Build those relationships. That's the, I think the biggest thing. Again, I can't tell you the number of times I've sat in a, sat in a room, cleared the rest of my afternoon, and spent time with uh, somebody who has just a really great idea that wants, wants to learn. Because I, I want to help them. Because ultimately, these are the things that change healthcare. And, I, you know, regardless if you're in a big organization, you're in a digital health startup, or you're, uh, you're at the NHS, or wherever you are, if you're looking to work in the, uh, the healthcare space, the one common thread is we all want to make that process better. Healthcare and patient, and patient care in general, you're tapping into something that we can all fundamentally relate to. It's incredibly powerful. And so that improvement to, the, uh, to uh, the community, that improvement to the process, to the people, that, that's something that's common. 
And so to use that as a foundation and then have, build those relationships, learn, and then you'll end up with a much better product and a uh, organization that's going to help you sell it. I mean, it just, it's, uh, it's a win-win. So I would say when you're developing your innovation, think about how is it going to improve care outcomes? How is it going to create efficiencies in the system? And how is it going to improve the patient experience? And I guess linked to those, how is that going to align with what healthcare organizations want? Because ultimately, I think you can only ever make money with a healthcare product if you're going to sell to some of the big organizations, private or public. B2C, I'm not convinced alone can, can, can really sort of do it for you. So I guess that's, that's what I would say.